I found out recently that I was wrong about something, which is fascinating because it's never happened before. It's never happened before. I had this really interesting fact that I would tell people about the way screens work, like computer screens, TV screens, phone screens, and it turns out it's completely wrong. So um, you might know that a computer screen is made up of pixels and each pixel is made up of three sub pixels that are red, green, and blue in color. And the brightness of those three sub pixels is adjusted to trick you into seeing all the colors in between red, green, and blue. And it really is a trick, by the way. Like if the monitor wants you to see yellow, then it will dial up the brightness of the red subpixels and the green subpixels, and you will experience that as yellow. I can recreate that effect here with torches. So look, I've got a red and a green torch. When I overlap them, I see yellow. I'm experiencing yellow in the overlap, but there is no yellow light going into my eyes. There is no light with a yellow wavelength entering my eyeballs. So there's obviously some kind of trickery going on there, which I'll get to in a minute, but just for completeness, let's first look at all three subpixels, red, green, and blue, but with torches. So red, green, and blue are called the additive primary colors. And when they add together, they make white. So look, all three together makes white. And in the crossovers, you've got yellow. We've seen that already. You've got cyan, that's when blue and green are added together. And you've got magenta, that's when blue and red are added together, the opposite ends of the spectrum added together without green. And you may recognize those three crossover colors cyan, magenta, and yellow from your printer. That's why they're called the expensive primary colors. They're also called the subtractive primary colors because you subtract them from white. You start off with a white sheet of paper, that's all colors mixed together. And then by laying down pigment like magenta, you're actually subtracting color from the page. So for example, with magenta, you've got white light shining on the page. Magenta absorbs green, it subtracts green and reflects blue and red. So how does this trick work where a computer monitor can make you see all these colors just using red, green, and blue light? Well, it turns out this ability to mix colors together and get other colors has nothing to do with physics and everything to do with biology. It's to do with how your eyes work. So you might know in the back of your eyes, you've got these cells called cone cells. And these are the cells that are responsible for your perception of color. You might also know that you've got three types of cone cells in your eyes. And for this video, I'm actually gonna oversimplify things a little bit because in my next video, I'm gonna dive into the amazing way that cone cells work. It's so interesting. But for this video, let's just say we've got three types of cone cells and we're gonna call them red cone cells, green cone cells, and blue cone cells. So, and again, I'm oversimplifying, but the red cone cells are sensitive to the red part of the spectrum, the blue cone cells are sensitive to the blue part of the spectrum, and the green cone cells are sensitive to the green part of the spectrum. But you'll notice that the sensitivity of these different cone cells overlap each other. So when yellow light enters your eyes, it stimulates your red cones a little bit and your green cones a little bit. So your brain is receiving a message, or maybe your visual system is receiving a message from your red cones and your green cones simultaneously. And your visual system interprets that information as yellow light, which is great, that's amazing. Your brain has deduced something about the world that it can't perceive directly. You don't have cone cells specifically for yellow light, but you've been able to interpret yellow light coming into your eyes. But it does mean that your visual system can be tricked. And that's what your computer screen is doing. It's what I was doing with the torches. By stimulating your red cones with red light and your green cones with green light, you see the color in between. You see yellow light because that's what your brain is wired to do. So that's the background. Here's the fact that I was telling people. A computer screen cannot recreate the experience of seeing violet light. Because if you think about it, you've got red, green, and blue subpixels, and you can change the brightness of those subpixels to reproduce the experience of any color in between red, green, and blue. But the rainbow goes red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Indigo and violet are outside of the gamut of possible colors you can create with RGB, with red, green, and blue subpixels. 
So if you want to experience violet, you have to go out into the real world. It's a terrifying place, but it has rainbows and rainbows have violet in them. Or you could look at something that's violet, like a violet. Of course, this violet that I'm showing you on the screen is a poor imitation of the real experience of looking at an actual violet because a computer screen doesn't have violet pixels. It can only show what's between red and blue. And if you've ever seen an illustration of the color spectrum on a computer, you may have seen something beyond blue that looks like this. It looks like magenta. And that's just where the illustrator has kind of bodged it. They've put magenta there in place of violet because they don't have violet pixels to play with. Except that I'm completely wrong. A computer screen can recreate the experience of seeing violet in the real world. But how can that be? Well, it turns out that actually, if you look at a rainbow and you look beyond blue, it kind of does look like magenta. And that's because the way cone cells work isn't quite as straightforward as I described. If you look at the sensitivity spectrum of what we're calling red cones, well, there's a big bump in sensitivity on the red end of the spectrum, as you would expect. They're sensitive to red light. But because of a quirk of biochemistry, there's also a second smaller bump over in the far blue part of the spectrum. So when violet light is shining into your eyes, it stimulates your blue cones and your red cones at the same time. In other words, when you look at the violet part of a rainbow, what you're experiencing is the same as what you would experience if there was red and blue light shining into your eyes at the same time. In other words, magenta. And that's how a computer screen can recreate the experience of that far end of the rainbow. It just needs to dial up the red slightly. So yeah, I was wrong. I don't even know why I heard that fact. Maybe I came up with it myself, which is terrible. That's like a really bad way to do science. Just have a think about something and go, yeah, that's probably true. There is still a sense in which um, it's challenging to faithfully recreate the experience of seeing a rainbow digitally. And it's not to do with the display that you use, it's to do with the camera that you take the picture with. So you may know that a camera sensor also has pixels, but they're sensing pixels as opposed to light emitting pixels. They're still called pixels and they have red, green and blue sub pixels that are sensing the light coming into the lens. And um, if you're a camera manufacturer, then you want your pictures to faithfully reproduce the human experience. But that's actually really hard to do. And it turns out some cameras don't really faithfully reproduce the um, absorption spectrum or the sensitivity spectrum of the human cones. I recreated a rainbow in the garden um, using a hose when the sun was out. And with my GH5, you can see there is that magenta just beyond the blue. So it looks as though the red pixel sensors in my GH5 do have that second bump of sensitivity in the far blue. My Panasonic GH2 seems to have that second bump. But interestingly, the GoPro, the GoPro Hero 7 at least, the one that I've got, um, doesn't show magenta at the end of the rainbow. If you take a picture of a rainbow with a GoPro Hero 7, violet will disappear. It will just look blue. Just to confirm that, I've got a laser pointer here. It's 405 nanometers, which is violet. In my GH5, you can see that's kind of working quite well. In some senses, there's a bit too much red there. But look, in the GoPro Hero 7, it's just, <laughs> there's, there's no violet there. It's just blue. Because it's quite difficult to take a picture of a rainbow anyway, because they're actually quite faint and quite thin, I've got this thing, it's a spectroscope. So any light that shines into this slit here is split up into its component wavelengths, a bit like a prism, except it uses diffraction. This is what white light looks like through my GoPro. And you can see there's only blue there. There's no violet slash magenta. It's also interesting to see how quickly it transitions from cyan to blue. It's very sudden. This is what it looks like to the GH5, which is 
a bit better. So there you go. It's difficult to take a good picture of a rainbow and that's why. An interesting consequence of all this is I had a problem uh, when I first started investing in cameras and lenses and lights. I got this big light box and I bought a load of complex fluorescent light bulbs to go in there because um, that would be a nice way to light myself, right? That's studio lighting. Um, and the bulbs look white, but if you look at the light through the spectroscope, you can see that actually it doesn't have that nice even distribution of wavelengths that you get from the sun. But in general, that wouldn't be a problem. Like if you were looking at me in person, I, I would look normal. There's an incompatibility between the weirdness of these complex fluorescent bulbs and the weirdness of the sensor in my camera. But I'll just, I'll, I'll show you. So here I am illuminated just by the complex fluorescent bulbs. And you can see that I'm a little bit green. It's weird, isn't it? And I just couldn't figure it out for so long because the light doesn't look green and it doesn't make other things look green. It's just the way it interacts with the pigment in my skin and the sensor in the camera. In the end, I just decided to switch to LED panels. I've got these LED panels here just to see if that would um, make a difference. And it did. It turns out the spectrum from these LED bulbs is a lot smoother, a lot closer to the spectrum of white light from the sun. And I use this now just to light the room. For the sponsor message this week, I thought I'd share an embarrassing story while we're on the subject of getting things wrong, which it turns out I do quite a lot. The sponsor is Dashlane, the password manager, and the embarrassing story is about how I fell for a phishing attack. This is a few years ago now. I got an email that appeared to come from Microsoft and it mentioned a friend of mine by name and it said that they wanted to share an album of photos with me through OneDrive. So I click on the link and I log into OneDrive. Except that I don't log into OneDrive, of course. Instead, what I do is I give my Microsoft credentials to a malicious person. And then they logged into my Hotmail account, presumably automatically, and sent out similar emails to all of my contacts. So you can see how uh, the, the loop is closed there. And the reason it's embarrassing is because I like to think that I don't fall for that sort of thing. Except that on this occasion, the friend in question, we'd just been to a wedding together, so it makes sense that they would want to share an album of photos with me. And the fake website was really good, and I was jet lagged. The point is, you only have to let your guard down once. Like, if that had been my Google account, it would have been absolutely disastrous. You've probably already heard a lot of the benefits of using a password manager, but you might not know that a password manager can also protect you from phishing attacks. Because if you think about it, if you're only using your password manager to fill in your online credentials, well, a password manager isn't going to fall for a fake website. It's not gonna fall for a lookalike URL. It's gonna check the SSL certificates of the website that you're on. In other words, a password manager is never going to fill in your details on a phishing scam website. Will a password manager give you 100% protection? No. Is it better than not using a password manager? Definitely yes, and really that's all that matters. I used Dashlane recently to change a whole load of my lame passwords on a whole bunch of websites, so I don't need to worry about password reuse attacks anymore, like if one of those services gets compromised, it's not an issue. Uh, some of the other features that I like, uh, it syncs with your phone. Um, you can share logins with people without them even knowing the password and it will autofill forms for you, including credit card details. So it's a real time saver. If that sounds useful to you, you can try it for free on your first device, whether that's your laptop or your phone, by going to dashlane.com forward slash Steve. And if you like it and you wanna to upgrade to premium, you can get 10% off using my code Steve when you check out. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, don't forget to hit subscribe and I'll see you next time.